I'll do the intro. Make sure the stream takes. There we go, we are live. What's that? It's all good. It's okay. It's all right. Hey, evening, everyone. Welcome to the final WordPress uh, meet presentation seminar for the year. We've got two more meetups planned, which are just social meetups in uh, June and July. So make sure you check the meetup calendar for those. We're just gathering at the uh, uh, Boston Pizza up by Save On Foods for an afternoon of uh, pizza and drinks and a little bit of fun and maybe get some ideas. So welcome to the meetup. I'm John Overall. For those that don't know who I am yet, which pretty much every face in here is familiar except a couple. And uh, tonight's presentation is going to be by Sean DeWolf and from DeWolf Consulting. And he's going to be talking about uh, WordPress maintenance and monitoring of your WordPress website, making it easy for you. And if you really don't want to do it yourself, hire the man to do it for you. But <laughs> at any rate, I'm going to let Sean take it over. There you go, Sean. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So yeah, so tonight's topic is care and feeding of your WordPress website. Uh, it's about the maintenance, monitoring, and how to stay with your WordPress site and keep it in good working order, keep it predictable, keep it safe. Uh, just a primer for who I am. I'm a web developer, and I've been working with uh, stuff on the web since 96, been into computers since 84. I've uh, been doing WordPress since 2011, and uh, by and large, I used to split my time between Drupal Consulting and WordPress Consulting, but in the last few months, I've moved all the way over to just WordPress Consulting and rescuing people from Drupal. So that's, those are sort of two things. If, if you're stuck in Drupal, um, you know, I'll help you get out. <laughs> so. And uh, as you saw on the first screen there, there's lots of dragons as a motif in this. And the idea is dragons and uh, WordPress have some stuff in common. And uh, those qualities can kind of bite you. So, you know, for example, they live in secluded places, server rooms versus caves. Uh, in server rooms, they can be hosted anywhere. On the cloud, they could be ending up in lots of different places, lots of different server environments. And you may, you may be surprised by what that server environment and how it affects your website and its performance. Uh, websites and dragons both guard their treasure. They both have a lot of confidential important data and you want to keep that stuff secure. You want to make sure everything's working on your website because the jeopardy is that that data could get released or you could get unauthorized access to your site. And, you know, it's a discounted thing until it, until it bites you, and then you discover just how critical it is and how easy it is if the website isn't entirely uh, dialed in from a security perspective. Um, and those weaknesses and their defenses can be a big factor, and trying to narrow those in and, and, and zero them out as a factor is, is a big thing. Um, and again, not cared for the go berserk. And if you go out there on the web, you can see people who launched a site and somehow kept it hosted, and it's old, and it is full of malicious code, and bad everything, and they're out there, and uh, they have to be kind of brought back, crawled back in. One thing I want to say while I'm going through this is, if I get to any particular point, and there's something you want me to stop on and dive into details, just, just raise your hand and say, I'm happy to do questions at the end, but I'm also keen to do questions throughout. So, <clears throat> um, as John alluded to previously, uh, I've been doing more WordPress support, but really since the start of me working in the web in 96, I've been doing support as a factor of what I'm doing because you want to make sure your website's running, you want to make sure it's, it's maintained, you want to make sure it's there just from a developer's completely selfish standpoint. You want it there as a, as a resume piece or a portfolio piece. So uh, that's always been the thing with me, of make sure it stays running, make sure it stays in good working order. Uh, back in the old days, that was, uh, when servers were kind of a little more of an arcane thing, like you had a guy who ran this hosting space and you ran it, and I happened to the guy that actually went into the secure room in the middle of nowhere and had to tap in because your network connection failed and you had to bring up the server while you're standing up to get it back, you couldn't do a remote. So that was kind of the foundational stuff of what I did. Um, 
And yeah, there was back in the dark days, the Wild West days, there was a lot less automation, there was a lot fewer tools, it was a lot harder to work with, and that made it a lot trickier prospect, and I think that really helped to keep things at, when it was an infancy stage, just coming up short. So in the more recent years, what I've done is because we've kind of zeroed on using WordPress, it's become more of a dependable tool and a well-known tool, and there's, rec there's pieces that are easily replicated, you can take it into the development environment and kind of be able to compare apples and apples. So support now has gotten to be easier and more predictable. Some of the basics of what you need to consider when you're talking about uh, servers and their maintenance, or support is, and the maintenance, is uh, reliable server space, good support from your server company, good selection of plugins, a finite list of plugins, buttoning down your security during the install process, continuing with good security practices and good hygiene, uh, frequently reviewing the security and the plugins to see what their state is like, and along the way making sure you trap lots of what I call res as restore points or backups. So you can reset back to that point and maybe you, the, what you lose is so minimal that it's unnoticeable by anybody. Or maybe everybody loses like the last six hours of their work. You know, that, that sort of restore point is a sweet spot where you get it to kind of match the frequency of what the what the updates what the updates are happening like on the website. So reliable server space, um, that's where the devil or the devil's in the details. Uh, you want space that is consistent. In other words, if they come out and you see that the site's running great one day really poor than the next, is the site um, doing weird things like something's failing to load, if resources get moved around, like in the dark days of the web, I worked with one company and they didn't really think it was important to be reliable. Like they just kind of, it was just kind of an asterisk. And with that, they did stuff like um, one company in town, that's still a big company and going well despite what happened with the web presence, uh, they just pulled the company's web server and just left it in somebody's kitchen for a week and then put the website the web server back on hosting and put it up with them and said, what, it's back, it's just down for a week because it was sitting in somebody's kitchen. <laughs> and somebody else uh, in those dark days also decided to run an adult site, which, you know, nowadays it's done, but back then it was really hard for them to do and they uh, kept moving it everywhere. So the client, the end client would say, well, where's my website this week? because it would be moved to some other obscure address, and this was pre-Google days. So you did it, and as long as you somehow shared our website links and caught people up, they'd find it again. But it was just the definition of weird, and I've seen lots of other places do that too. One place I saw, they um, changed their terms and conditions midway through to allow for the things that they were doing that was weird. So then they said, no, we've always allowed for this. So just be careful, weird, weirdness is a tell. Um, are they powerful? Like in other words, do they have a lot of assets and resources available? Uh, some servers seem to just be full of resources and that's really great. Some of them, uh, you get above like one gig worth of hosting space and they tap out and, you, and it's miserly. I mean nowadays, price per gigabyte for storage is so cheap. If they're really miserly on some of these resources, that's a tell that their service space may, may not be kind of in the game to win for you. Um, the other thing that's really important is the Goldilocks zone. Like, Whenever I'm looking for pricing, if somebody offers me $5 hosting, I will not, I won't take it because even though $5 is a great deal, it's too good to be true. And likewise, some people do like $1,000 a month for the same service. You need to find that Goldilocks zone that is kind of on the upper tolerance of what your budget is, but also um, reasonable for what you think is fair value. And I guess maybe walk in their shoes and say, what if I were hosting a website? How much would I charge if I were the web host guy? And if it's like, you know, well, I don't know, it's $1,000, well, maybe, maybe that is the right price. But, you know, the Goldilocks zone is really important. And the other one, too, is there's lots of review websites out there. And you've got to make sure that you check those websites for what the reputation is for those companies. Jacob? Do you ever uh, use a shared host for I, those websites? I do. And it's a gut check on, on where it goes. Like, um, some of my bigger clients, they uh, have three websites that share with each other, but they're on their own server instance otherwise. And it's not its not an instance, it's a server. And um, other places, if it's not really important, I know the bandwidth is really low, 
and they'll kind of get to share a fairly, fairly busy piece of the pie. And I always monitor resources and hey, response time. And if, if the behavior is poor and the response time is poor, then that's the tell they got to get the resources. So I, th I think I usually try to match that against the boy locks on apply to how much you can split the space. And some hosts, they get good, they get oversubscribed, and then they go through that too. They go, well, we put 100 sites on this box. I bet 150 be okay. And then they take it too far, they go, I bet 250 be okay. And then it's all of a sudden the dam breaks and they discover everything that's not responding. And, and I've seen places push that and you start with a really great reputation. Like there's a few places I could mention, I won't mention, but there's one of them that they had fantastic rep. They were just good across the board from everyone's perspective. But anyone who was up for more than three months always left because they seemed to be good in their opening game. But by the time you got three, three months of whoopsies, you went because it was suddenly, suddenly bad, suddenly weird excuses. Um, good support from the server company is the piece. Every host, no matter how good, is going to have a bad day. And how they respond to bad times, your bad times and their bad times and just conditions, is really a big tell. Like I have one host who I work with who are really great. And uh, I get occasional personalized emails from them. It's not personalized like spam, like a MailChimp can come out. It's, hey, Sean, this has happened. I went in and I changed this stuff for you because it was a hack. And rather than tell you about it and have you react, it was easier just to fix it. So I fixed it and locked it down for you. It's like, perfect. You did. He did no, you know, do no harm with what he practiced. And that good proactive stuff is really important because no matter how good the code is, no matter how good the hosting environment is, being reactive to stuff. And when you can't be proactive, it's huge. Um, do they have an intact support system? And the support system is always critical. Like, can you get in and, and ask questions? Do they go through the train? Do you see the long list of stuff? Can you track those historical things? Uh, so you can see what happened with your old support tickets. You know, it seems like a no-brainer that they can keep your history of support tickets, but some places do kind of zero them out. So it's really important to make sure that they have a good practice for how they log and respond to support tickets. And do they just let them linger for days on end, or do they react to them and, and jump on them? And you should get an autoresponder almost immediately. And if you don't, that's free. That's free. And then they should say something about it. If it's easy to fix, hopefully it's resolved in an hour, and maybe it's upwards of a day. There's one host I work with who I really like, and we've been batting around an issue for about four days now, but it's not like anything's on fire, it's just holding up one feature, and they're actually engaging with me on a coding topic, so they're still keeping my respect because they're still doing good stuff, they're just, there's the back and forth that's taking a while. Um, one easy way when you're reviewing the host and trying to figure out if they're good or not, is you can sniff the support system. A lot of them will have their support system and their sales system as one and the same, so if you log a ticket into their sales system as a support ticket, and they're actually engaging with you, what they're going to do is they're going to come back and they're going to respond to you in a good manner. And if they're trying to chase your bucks and get your business, and they're sluggish and kind of half-hearted in how they respond to you as your sales prospect, I think they're going to be not as eager as an actual client. So you kind of want to you want to say that a bad sales experience is going to probably lead to a bad support experience. Um, good selection of plugins. There's a list of plugins I always have, and um, what you want to do is when you're selecting plugins, and I mean, John's done shows on this, John's WordPress A disease is about that, but uh, you want to make sure are they stable? Uh, is there any sort of bad reputation associated with them? Like, you know, they're finicky, you kind of don't want that. Have they been updated recently? There's enough advance between uh, PHP and hacking attempts, malware, JavaScript and the WordPress community that there's a good reason why any given plugin is updated in the last six months, just to do good housekeeping. So if you're looking at a plugin and it hasn't been updated in the last six months, then it may be something that's virtually not being abandoned. So you want to make sure that your selection of plugins does factor in whether or not they're, they're stable, they're supported, they have a future. Because if they don't have a future, they may have something that has a lot of jeopardy and you're just going to sign it off. The other big thing is, uh, in addition to a good list, you know, it's, uh, I'm here for a good time, not a long time, uh, a finite list of plugins. You, every piece of code you put on your site drags your site down. It's just no matter how good it is and how important it is, that code, for what it gives you, it also takes away in performance, a little or a lot. So what you have to do is make sure that this stuff works well. 
And you have to ask, how is that complexity that you're trying to accomplish with the plugin actually satisfied well by a given plugin? Like some plugins, I've seen plugins that when you get into them, they're like four, actual four or five lines of code, but they're there, they're for every page load, when maybe they're only used for one page and one piece of functionality, but they're being satisfied with the whole plugin. So it becomes something that kind of drags down. Better plugins will, will steer around that problem, but other plugins will just kind of add to your load. So just make sure that you are containing how much you're putting on your server, less is more. Some people I've, I've heard say 10 plugins, and it's like, well, I can't see you get out of the driveway with just 10. But um, there's some who have everything on there. I've seen in some cases four active competing plugins that do the same thing. And I also don't know how that can work. So you have to come up with that sweet spot that's above uh, a threshold, probably above those 10 plugins, but still at the point where you go, okay, if I satisfied everything in a way that's going to be good. If there's any weird use cases or a single off from one page, find a way that maybe a plugin isn't going to satisfy that. Maybe you sink the time into making a themed page that just has some code in it that satisfies that one page of its behavior. Yes? You have to give away your uh, intellectual property, but do you have a little short list of ones that you put on every site? Oh, yeah. Um, my short, my, the list I love, and, and here it is. Um, for the sake of portability, I really love Duplicator because it's good for being able to migrate stuff around. And there are other ones that work really well, but I really love Duplicator. Weirdly enough, and again, this is the, I just said don't duplicate your functionality. WP Migrate DB. I also love, and it does a lot what Duplicator does, but Duplicator takes everything soup to nuts and gives you an install file that's a PHP script and a great big data file that's, that's a, a data, that's just a huge chunk of data, it could be 200 to 600 megs, it's just massive. But you plunk those into your destination of choice, you know your database app access, like what's your username, password, database name, uh, fire those into Duplicator and 10 minutes later your site's completely cloned and almost, I've, I'm sure there are certain circumstances where it glitches out, but I've never had a glitch out. Uh, WP Migrate DB from, I think, Free Minds. I've got that wrong. What they do is, in their earlier incarnations, delicious brains. Delicious brains. Thank you, John. Uh, that's the little mind icon that was stuck in my head. But uh, WP Migrate DB is fantastic because there you can trap database exports. And they're really good because it's all SQL statements. So it's simple. You can crawl through the statements, you can mess with them, and everything else. But the more recent updates of the WP Migrate DB, they do um, find and replace, which I've seen other things do find and replace, but their find and replace in that thing is amazing because previously every find and replace I've used has freaked me out. I've gone into the database and done manual find and replace, crawling through every table and coming find and replace statements to make it happen. They blow up in my face and it's horrible. But WP Migrate DB does it and I've yet to see it honestly fail. If your logic is bad going in, you're going to get bit. But if your logic is clear, you're changing, you know, Sam to Joe in all instances, it'll work fantastic. And even though Duplicator and MigrateDB are the similar stuff, they're both distinct and, and do really great stuff in themselves. Um, I'm a big fan of Gravity Forms because I think websites need interactivity, so they need a form. And the form solution I always go to is Gravity Forms. I've done stuff with WP Forms. I've done stuff with Contact Form 7. I've done stuff where I've made my own form stuff. Uh, from scratch, and those are good, but w, or Gravity Forms has just got it locked down. The functionality is great. Um, as a developer, because um, you are rolling out a lot of these, I have a license that allows me to roll out from my one legit license up for a whole bunch of clients, mm -hmm. and then get a lot of nice bells and whistles. So one recent thing I did with Gra Gravity Forms, I did a whole talk on this a few months ago, but one thing I did with Gravity Forms was I got everything about an intake system happening for signing on new people. It goes through an e-commerce solution, it comes back with a response. Along the way it stops and it takes all the form data and dumps into PDFs that are then attached and sent to the end recipient. So they have a nice permanent PDF that isn't an HTML page or something else. It's actually nice. It can be formatted for formats other than just 8.5 by 11. Um, just hugely powerful. And that's just one little way you trick up gravity forms. Um, what are the other ones? I love I found it almost impossible to launch without uh, um, ACF, which is the Advanced Custom Fields and Advanced Custom Fields Pro. That one is huge for being able to trick out post types. Mm -hmm. I also use um, CPT, which is Custom Post Type, because it does post types and taxonomies, and that was really great. And I find that ACF and CPT kind of always have to play together because mm -hmm. the two of them are genius and by themselves, which is not that. They're great, they're good, but they're 
they're multiplied by being together. Um, beyond that, I will sometimes use if I'm, a, a trick I've been doing recently because a lot again getting people jailbroken from Drupal is um, what I'll do is I'll come up with a way to export data sources from a legacy website and import it into into the new site using WP All Import Pro. That's a lot of nice features. And again, Duplicator does import exports. WP you know WP Migrate DB does too. Duplicate or um, WP all import pro, which is a mouthful, will allow you to uh, take these remote data sources and push them into your stuff. So there's something I did for a local college where every day it goes and it goes to its legacy data source and just grabs and up, updates the WordPress site with its new data and works pretty well because it's just using data and using established rules and replacing old data with new. So you know those those are the ones that are really good. Oh, and the other one I mentioned here. Uh, I feed security, it's huge, it's killer. Um, and with that, I also use one called redirection. And what happens with those two is I themes security, it's great because it will lock down your support, your lock down your admin site so it moves it from WP login, which is easy to grab, and makes it something understandably obscure. And if you're like me and see that serial and need to settle in this phase of my life. It emails you with this thing, by the way, we changed that. So then you can go to fish through your emails as the admin of the site mm -hmm. and come back and get get the uh, the right alternate login instead of being stuck guessing what it is. So uh, yeah, iThemes is huge. Redirection is great too, because you can put it on the sniffer or 404s that happen. And what I found after one popular site that I did launch and had a lot of malicious, a lot of malicious actors waiting to act, is the 404s were the their attempts to come in and do bad things. So they had agents that weren't, you know, they weren't smart enough to fake it out from to make it look like fireworks or, or IE or Chrome or something. So they were just coming in with a Python agent as their user agent. And they're coming in from specific locations. And they, so it was plain as day who these bad actors were. But when you said, well, all the bad, all there's no legitimate traffic coming from this Python user agent. And there's no legitimate traffic coming from Central Park in London. So you say, okay, all the bad actors are in this cluster, and all of the bad actors are also using these tool sets. And then you went into iThemes security and said, yeah, don't let these guys in their IP range in, don't let these guys who are using these user agents in. And then beyond that, of course, they give you URLs that are dead URLs where they're probing for stuff. And then you can look through all that things. Anything of that string, that user then becomes banned. Mm -hmm. So iThemes is huge when it's supplied with that sort of source for data to lock in and shut down bad actors that come through. So yeah, so, is that good? That's great. Okay. Um, so buttoning down the security on the install, and it's good to do this right in the install because even though the robot's text is saying don't follow the site, I have seen the sites get hacked while they're, while they're in dev space if the dev space is anyway findable. So um, <clears throat> some of the no-brainers is make sure your database password is complicated because you're almost never going to have to use it and it's sitting in the WP config file, you can make it crazy complicated because you just have, it's always going to be in that file. So just, you know, I saw one recently where it was the name of the website. I was like, okay, <laughs> got to be trickier than that. Uh, this is one that I thought was getting caught every time by everybody, but it isn't. In the WP config file, there's a, uh, several lines of something called salts. And these are kind of seeds for your encryption. And WordPress often ships with it saying, put your unique key here, which then converts into a reproducible salt that if you use, you can get into a site that hasn't dealt with this. So if you take, put your unique key here as your salt and your code, and then you push in bad actions into stuff, inside of WordPress, because it is a pretty smart system and maybe too smart for its own good, it has something called uh, remote procedure calls. And those re remote procedure calls get fired and they can do stuff on your site. They can update databases, um, they can create files, they can they just do, they basically run the show when they have proper credentials. And the proper credentials they need is to get through with a legit salt, like <coughs> place, your, place your salt here. So if they guesses it, you're completely overwhelmed. And if your site's been overwhelmed and you don't know why one thing might be that this thing from the opening volleys of your install didn't get uh, fixed up. And those are always put in in your WP 
Okay, the fake file about two thirds of the way down the file if it's not automatically generated. Just to look for it and make sure it's there. WordPress, if you Google it, has a, if you say, have WordPress salt generator, uh, they have a salt generator. Every time you load it, it comes up with a new set of salts. And you just load until you, you know, load gravel when you like, use it, and you're good. Um, again, as previously mentioned, security from iThemes is genius. Uh, every level, the freebie is great, when you're paid for, one is even better. Um, one thing it will do is it will caution you about locking down security permissions and files and directories. And when you come in and you say, give me a report card of what's good and what's bad, it will say, these directories are a little loose, this file's a little loose, this one needs to be tightened up, and then will kind of go, hang on, this is really bad. So just respond to what iThemes tells you, and that will let you lock down your files. So they're not impervious, but they're a lot harder to deal with. One place I dealt with where there's a lot of legitimate paranoia about permissions is everything on the server was locked in with a password that was um, just known by a handful of people and not used in the web in the Apache piece of it at all. And it's just completely locked down. And that was to try to take all this stuff to the next level. It was good. It actually kind of trips up development and maintenance a little bit because you have to kind of go in with this root level password to do stuff. So while it's really good and really handy and it's, it's nice that it's saving my bacon, it does get in the way of maintenance a little bit. So ongoing, um, some of your good security practices, and this echoes a lot of stuff we've kind of spoken last year in the previous sessions with John, is the, the biggie is make sure your admin username is not admin. Uh, make sure your password is complex, but not so complex you won't get it. Uh, one at end I put in there that I forgot to put in here is make sure all your email addresses are ones you still monitor. And I've had that because I had an old consulting company about six years ago, and I had my current consulting company, and I, I missed it on that step. And some of my reminders and resets and important stuff was going to addresses for the old company. And luckily, because I run the I run the server and run the database, I could fix it. But if I couldn't get to it via the database and the server, I couldn't get to it at all. So if you have a website you're maintaining your kind of arm's length from, and you're attempting to recover a password and it's going to a email address, that will happen. So I've, I've been stung like that, and it's not possible for us to get stung like that too. Um, the other piece is be stingy with the admin role. Some people talk to you, oh, I really need it, I really need it. And um, still be stingy. And there are ways to fine tune um, fine tune permissions, and there are some plugins that are good out there. They'll let you fine tune every action that's happening on your site to associate with a given role, and you can make new roles. So you can make a role that's kind of admin but not admin, and give them a lot of keys but not the keys to the kingdom. So that's that's the thing about stinginess. And uh, again, as I said earlier, I theme to change the back end back end to something a little more cryptic but still memorable. And uh, frequent reviews of plugin security. That's kind of part of your ongoing maintenance to make sure things are in good shape. I use, again, as I said previously, the redirection plugin. It's really great. It traps a 404, so it looks for where people are trying to probe your, probe your system and come up with exploits. In some cases, usually they rebound and they don't get it, because I think if they succeed, you'll notice that you've got malware in your site. So it's, it's, you've, you've worked or you're exploited. You're kind of never, in that, you're never lucky enough to get that state where you're going to get exploited if you just don't if you just don't act. So it's still good practice. Um, again, good hygiene through the iThemes screen. Um, go back daily or as frequently as possible to your plugin screen and look for all the plugins that you can update. And um, with those the plugins, by the time they get there to that update stage, they're usually not going to blow up on you. And ideally, what you do is you don't do it on a live site. What I often do is I take recurring snapshots. Whenever, especially when I'm going to go through a pass of doing the updates and go to a development space or something that's safe and if I have any questions about a given plugin being safe to update, I'll, I'll do the update there and see if it bites me. And one bad combo of two or three plugins recently did do that where basically it made um, the WYSIWYG editor in post editing unavailable. So you could cut and paste but you couldn't you know, highlight with your cursor and start typing your article. So that was a bad thing, but by going in and figuring out what was what, then I just, um, I think in that case, in that case, in the production, because there was no security impact, 
I just didn't update the plugin. But again, a development space where it blows up on you is going to expose that, as opposed to production where you have to then get it and rewind and it might not be where you want. So frequent frequent updates or, or checks into your admin plugin page. That said, um, I didn't cover off themes in there because that's a different kettle of fish. Um, often themes. You want to get a child theme going with somebody, and that's and that site will be a little bit different, and it, the child theme may not play well with the parent theme after it updates. It's supposed to because your child's supposed to lend and add rules, but it's not 100% that's the case. If they've done something big in the parent theme, you find a hard way to get child theme and your parent theme don't mesh. So that's something you do very carefully. And one company I work with that does um, updates for a list of white label clients. They will go through liberally and make sure plugins work and are updated, but themes they always tread so carefully that it's almost like a special case to update a theme. So if there's a security exploit, yeah, you've got to take the hit and do it. Do it in a dev, dev space so that way you can see what the theme looks like and if it collides with the parent. And otherwise, um, just be careful when it comes to the theme piece. Um, so restore points. Restoring seems a little daunting, but it isn't as daunting. A lot of people roll out websites using uh, hosts that have cPanel. And if you develop a site and launch it through Soft Softaculous, I always call it Softalicious. <laughs> Softaculous. <laughs> yeah, see, it catches me every time I say it. Softaculous is great because it's no shame to deploy a site by a Softaculous, like a WordPress site. Because it's there, it's logged in there, it monitors it for you on one level, which is great. But it also does recurring backups for you. You can do a schedule. And when I do it, I'll do once a day and keep four backups. So that way, if you've got a thing go weird on Monday, if you haven't caught it by Thursday, either you're probably, it's unlikely you're going to catch it. Or maybe you just, you know, it's not so bad. You're just going to live with it. So once a day and every day. Once a day, kept for four days. WP Migrate DB is good for trapping your data which is distinct and different from your file. So if you're uploading a lot of new media, then the new media won't get trapped by WP Migrate DB, but any database changes will. So the, the pro version allows you to do more recurring backups. And while you may do this one every day, let's say you have editors that are working all the time, you may want that one if it's not too much of a footprint to run like every hour. Uh, restore points, again, Duplicator Pro is fantastic for being able to give you good complete backups you can spin up somewhere else spin up somewhere safe and you can store them somewhere and they have a lot of tools for being able to stow that code somewhere where you can you can find it instead of having to manage it on your desktop and move it around and lots of stuff that can be done better through other alt better um, automation and the test your backups um test your backups is huge and everyone who doesn't think about testing your backups is just waiting for it and i remember one place i was working in a government institution it was a pretty big office, and uh, we were said, oh, let's go test your backups. So we put in a disk, and we, we did the restore, and the entire office just lost their computing. Just shut. And it was totally a mess, and everyone freaked out because the backup didn't work. They restored the backups, and then everyone's work was screwed. And it turns out because somebody had put one line of comment code into a loader script to load the backup, and that botched it, and nobody told anyone about that. So that meant no backup was going to work. So in a really critical non-test, government you know, has lots on the, on the line for it. Um, it would fail. So take your backups, routinely test them, see if they blow up in your face. If they blow up in your face, you don't have the insurance policy you think you have. So that's always a good piece of maintaining that. Um, in some cases, uh, clients will want to have their own stuff. They'll, they'll DIY it. Like, uh, they'll have a system in and house and they'll do the maintenance. In some cases, what they'll do is they'll farm out the work. And some places, you're be the, you'll be the developer, but maybe somebody else will come in for the support role. So if that's the case, and you're working with some piece of that, whether you're working with uh, finding the right support company, or whether you're, you're the developer who wants to take it on, these are some of the caveats that I've gone around when researching other support offerings and see what is sort of common threads or common themes to what they are. And they are frequent checks of your core, your theme, your plugins, and frequent plugin updates, as I said. Plugins get updated a lot, themes tread carefully. 
store offsite backup so that there's not a lot of jeopardy available to blow your blow up or erase your, your backups. SSL implementation because nowadays it's becoming an easier thing to do and it shouldn't be a barrier and Google considers ranking factor so a support system that doesn't somehow say hey we're just going to make sure you have SSL needs to be questioned because every, every site nowadays should run with SSL because Google, Google thinks it's important so we should think it's important. And I mean some sites don't have any personal data and anything confidential and any way to expose it but um, you can still hack in and embarrass the owner of the site. So there's still always jeopardy, and SSL mitigates that. Uh, those that have protections from denial of service attacks, or in this case DDoS, which is distributed denial of service attacks, a lot of sites can be knocked down and um, their defenses can be compromised and their capacity to respond. Yes. In this world of WordPress and websites, yeah. why, do, why is there so much, uh, sounds like, attacks and like these things that happen? Why is there so much attacking? It's popular. Yeah. That, that's the answer. And, and I mean, back in the day, like in the 90s, when everyone was on Windows and some people were on Mac and like you know, eight people were on Linux, everyone made viruses for Windows and kind of almost nobody made viruses for Linux. And that's the problem is WordPress now runs... 33% of the websites and something like way above that for the number of uh, CMS driven websites. So because it's so popular, it's really fruitful. If you come up with a good exploit that corrupts WordPress, let's say you do something that's gonna hit half of WordPress sites. You hit the button and 15% of the internet has a connection fit. So that's why. Because it's really it's really valuable and really fruitful. And and that's part one of it. The other part two is it's open source and some of the code is great and smart and some of the code isn't. And the code that isn't gets exploited. And some of the code that looks smart this year turns out the guys next year were smart enough to exploit it. So the nature of what open source is with the jeopardy of you can see all the source code so you know where the weaknesses are and the popularity and, the, and how attractive it is as a target, that's why you get so many exploits. I'm just curious, like, yeah. what is the value or the fruit for people attacking these things? In the case of um, we have no confidential information, it's simply earning your stripes to show off how you've embarrassed a given site. Like you could have, like, you know, how they just have a list of big sites that boast, you know, we, you know, MTV and Katy Perry and all these lists of high-profile websites are running off of WordPress. And what's happening is if you knock one of those down or you replace with mouth, you replace, you just make it embarrassing. That's a big win for somebody who wants to do it. John, as, as someone who runs server and hosting uh, company, it's not just that they gain uh, notoriety for hacking websites. The small websites that seem to have no value, no content, what the hackers are really after is the resources. Of yeah, the, the processing resources. They're after the processing resources. In the last year, one of the biggest things they used they hacked WordPress's websites for was to mine Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other big thing they hack WordPress websites for is to send spam email. Yeah. And those are the things that I've dealt with for clients on my servers and their websites being hacked. It wasn't because there's was anything valuable there, but the server resources are valuable. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, and what'll happen too, and I've seen this post hack happen where they will put malware on the site and then get a lot of traffic from that malware. And, and it's a weird thing that they will put malware on your site so that your site's a platform for getting them something that ultimately is profitable in some way. And then they will pump up and share your website to the four winds to make sure your site gets a lot of traffic. You see this big spike in traffic. You're like, whoa, things are looking good. Turns out it's all malware or, or originated traffic that is there to pick up malware from your site and, and deposit it on those desktops. And that happens. And then, you know, that, those are all just the non-confidential sites. When you get into sites where there's e-commerce, if somebody actually is you know, in the practice of storing credit cards or personal user data on the system, then that stuff's all great because you can just use a SQL statement and expose all of it. And even Yahoo, I mean, I went through a few years ago when Yahoo got exploited, and they were storing passwords in plain text. So if you reuse your password, or if you have a scheme that's easy to guess from your password, you know, like you know, this and that combine, and you always have yellow cat in your password, uh, those sort of easy gimmies, they can say, well, let's try this on everybody. So everywhere where, you know, it's, it's joe at hotmail.com, 
and yellow cat soy is part of his password. Let's use that as the beginning of what we're going to hack with. So they take these bare language password files, which some people think they're too smart to, to you know, get found out on, and they will grab them after exploiting the system through a malicious attack and just run rampant with it. And it's it, it that that's the that again that's the fruit. And then in some cases, uh, maybe it's just as simple as you've got your PayPal email address and your WordPress install for WooCommerce or Gravity Forms. And if they hack in and get access or put in a SQL statement that allows you to rewrite that, somebody goes off and makes a payment through an e-commerce provider, they, you've circumvented and sent them not to your PayPal, but to somebody else's PayPal who's malicious, and then continues on with the transaction. So-and-so picks up the check and you get stuck with fulfilling the order. Mm -hmm. That's why it's fruitful. Because WordPress does so much, it's really it's really valuable to knock down. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, um, so back so back to this. So denial of service attacks again. You just don't want to get hacked. Uh, you don't get your services knocked down. At the very least, if somebody's charging you for the bandwidth you're using, you don't want to pick up the bill for that because if they launch you know terabytes worth of traffic at you, um, your host may have some sympathy, but they probably won't give you a bill. Um, the other thing here about a good hallmark of support maintenance is do they put a CDN in the mix or a content delivery network? And content delivery networks are great, especially one I use called Cloudflare. And what they'll do is they kind of get between a, uh, your traffic and your host, and they will do stuff to put some of your resources closer to your host or closer to your traffic, so that way they don't have to wait for a signal to come from like you know far side of the far side of the planet to get to you. They'll come from maybe you know a, a city over, or that city. Uh, they'll do lots of stuff to deal with flood attacks where, again, the denial of service starts, they'll kind of nip it in the bud. And different CDNs, different content delivery networks deliver different things. I like Cloudflare um, because it has a good suite of stuff, and, and the freebie version has a good suite. Pay for one is even better. Uh, the other thing offered is uptime monitoring. And every morning I get a ping for one of my websites that every morning goes down for one minute. And you know, anyone looking at, at my family site from 133 to 134 is out of luck, and I know about it. Um, but nobody else knows about it because nobody goes to the site. But uptime monitoring is good to know because then you know when you're down, you don't know if it's just gone down and nobody's caught it. Because some said websites could be down and so they'll catch one like a day later. Um, or it, it, it trickles up to the site administrator. If they're not monitoring, it trickles up to them in a bad way. Um, and security monitoring and malware cleanup. Some places will offer it as saying they're going to do recurring security monitoring, and they'll say that as malware comes in, they'll, they'll do something about it. And usually that could be just go back to a safer store point, scrub back to like a core version of a WordPress install, and, and pick, up, pick up and get you back into a good state. Um, Oh, that is, this is so important I put it in twice. Um, Google Analytics set up, they'll do that too so you, as, as a way to help you because Google Analytics isn't really a high barrier thing, but for some people it becomes, um, it becomes something they go, what do I do? Where do I put the pixel? You know, they'll, some places will just do it to, for you as just part of it. Also, it helps them because then they, they may keep uh, access to that and be able to monitor and help you with your site or pick up something that could be worrisome or important. And they'll kick out reports, and that's always good too. They'll talk about the temperature of what your website's running like, maybe there's a way to do it better, and that's the sort of stuff that those will do too. Some of them I've seen, again, uh, we did a survey and came up, we went through about 30 different offerings and saw the commonalities of what all of them offer. And some of them put in little sweeteners like access to premium plugins. Again, WordPress costs at 130 bucks to 275 bucks, give or take. And a uh, developer gets to pay 275 bucks and pull it in a whole bunch of places. You coming in off the street will spend 130 bucks for your one website and not get all the bells and whistles. They could give you a really nice gravity form. This is a freebie, as a sweetener. Again, the other premium plugins are out there that are there and you know, add five or six of them and you send them well, like you know, several hundred dollars on just having a handful of nice, nice things. They'd throw them in as part of it so it very quickly pay for itself. Uh, some of them will put in things where they say, yeah, you give us any small task, like change your uh, email address or change your holiday notice or your hours or little, little tweaks. Um, they'll let you throw those out of little tiny volleys all the time. So for a client that wants to tweak things to death, 
um, they'll be out there available to do that sort of nice stuff. And some of them say we'll actually get in and do full on full on development. So if you want you know, a little piece of a custom plugin done in a month, or a custom theme page, or um, something else that's, that's kind of tricky, they'd be even up for even more advanced tasks. And that's what some of the third party support will offer. Um, yeah, well, I mentioned. Uh, so there are local experts who do third party support. Uh, Jacob Burma, as part of his talk a few months ago, he talked about everything he does. But the really nice piece is he finishes his development phase with moving into support phase where he keeps sites well cared for. And it really put a bug in my ear about just how good that is as an idea. And uh, again, he's in the room, he runs a really great service. Uh, John, o John Overall, also in the room, does support but also does hosting. So you kind of get that entire lifespan of what you're doing for hosting, that's up for grabs. I, when Aaron and I prepped a list, we uh, have that available if somebody wants to go through, check the links and compare and contrast, because we've got a big spreadsheet, and we're trying to figure a nice way to put it on the web, I just haven't got there, but we do have a list, and if you want us to share it with you, email clientcare at shondewolf.com with the subject WP support list, and they'll just send you what our data is, and you can see kind of unmitigated data. This is compared to trust for yourself. Um, so beyond uh, the great service that John's offering, there are ones that will do everything for you. And WP Engine and Flywheel are the two that come to mind easily. There are lots of others that do it too. So we'll set up a hosting environment that we made ideal for WordPress. So anyone who has a hosting environment that's a little weird, or it does something but not everything, and why isn't it working ideally for my WordPress site, WP Engine and Flywheel make it the whole business of making sure they deliver servers that give you excellent WordPress um, results. One thing I have found the caveat for the likes of WP Engine is they also kind of narrow the list of what you can use on their server. So a good example was uh, one of the extras you had to ask for was uh, random sorts in your data sets. <laughs> and it was a no-brainer that you maybe want to have the potential of randomness. But you, and they will give it to you, but they won't give it to you out of the box. You have to ask for them to flip the switch. So that, those are the little things. And get Flywheel was great. I handled them as a data source and everything else, but uh, they stopped short of having um, DNS inside of their services. So a lot of places that run cPanel and WHM, you'll be able to go in and you'll be able to tweak their cPanel to hi hat. But you go into Flywheel and they'll say, well, point your DNS at us, which is great if you have the sort of um, level of, of sort of development savvy and support savvy to have a server environment where you can throw uh, DNS. A lot of uh, registrars will have DNS as part of what they offer, but that's not 100%. So Flywheel, that's the sort of little thing about them that I like but I don't love. But otherwise, those done for you services can be really great for something who wants to have a, uh, a carefree experience. That said, those devils are in the details. They will have little gotchas that you have to be careful of, like uh, what cap, how much bandwidth you maybe will have, or they may even simply cap how many hits you're able to have. So as you explore those, if those seem like a prospect, just make sure that they're doing everything you really want them to do. And to finish it off with a shameless plug, um, what we did was we came up with three different support service plans when we talked about what we needed, because some people needed one person I said, well, you know, uh, do, do it right. It's like 100 bucks a month for support. Just to make sure you're managed and it's resourced and it's in that only box at the right price. And then went 100 bucks a month, oh, we were thinking 100 bucks a year. So we had a lower level plan, which is just kind of keeping the lights on, keeping it safe enough. And that one's 30 a month. So it's, it's an inexpensive, but it's not killer. Uh, the middle plan, which is kind of our the middle zone kind of gives you pretty much everything in most places you need, it's like 100 bucks a month. And then the wolf plan was the high level one where it did everything and had some really nice features, premium plugins, we did a lot to speed that up. It was kind of that idea that we think most people go for KOD because it's good value and good service. And this one's good too because it has lots of bells and whistles. But all the details are at shondawolf.com slash support. And how, they're all how, how has it been for you offering these three tiers? Um, it's been okay, a little slow for uptake because 
you know, again, that whole thing of I want to keep the websites of my clients running, uh, they kind of a little bit used to me keeping the sites running without a formalized plan in place. So that if I were a lot more cut and dry and, and cold about it, probably I would have more uptake because it would be more desperate. But, so that, that's the thing that's kind of hemmed, up, hemmed in my um, support system. So yeah, so people are, people are liking what we're offering, but uh, again, uh, we're still kind of building that market. So yeah, so questions, any questions? Good job, by the way. Thank you. Awesome. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons I'm here is I either gotta learn how to use it or find somebody who knows how to use this. Right. Like WordPress web type stuff. Right. Uh, and so my my seeking is knowledge of WordPress and websites on all levels, um, and I've gathered tons here. It's nice to I used to be a tech guy when I was in grade seven and eight. And right. I've been to high school, so that's like re-entering my brain. So I'm appreciating it. Uh, what I'm seeking is one someone who's not necessarily young, but someone who's learning this WordPress stuff and wants to join a team and like work, I guess pro bono, but for the sake of um, building a, an alliance or a team mm -hmm. and then taking the team to do stuff in the world. Uh, so that's what I'm seeking as an individual. Right. Um, so I don't know where to find those people. This is the first thing I've ever come to in like 10 years that's like yeah. techie. <laughs> so that's what I'm seeking. I don't know if you have an answer to where to find those people. As far as places to go for those sort of people, no, because, I, I mean, it's, it's a classic, no. But uh, two thoughts on it is one, uh, you could start a meetup group. I mean, we're in a meetup group. You start one and it says, let's learn WordPress. And that could be a meetup group where you sit down and everyone in the room figures out what WordPress is together. You're all grabbing the elephant and getting it worked out. Um, Can I interject on yeah, that yeah. one? Uh, before you start a meetup group, the last attempt at a WordPress meetup group somebody else tried to start, blamed and burned, feel free to contact me through the meetup group you currently have. We will more than happily let you facilitate a meetup and reach out to our thousand plus members. That's actually an awesome idea. That That's much better than you going through the grief of creating a meetup, which yes. of course is 80 bucks every six months to run a meetup group. Yeah. So you could do spin-off events of yeah. Let's Learn WordPress, and it's you and people just happy and send you We'll out. happily give you the access you need off the site to be a manager of the event and build the promotional materials around it to get people to come out. Yeah. yeah. And so the other place to go is um, go to Camosun and look for people. There's something called the Capstone Program, and that's something where uh, graduating tech students are coming out and looking for a special thing to do. So they kind of give you a little team, and that team is tech savvy, but may not be WordPress savvy. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is say to them, I got this project, it's WordPress, you have to ramp up on WordPress development. And then you say, this is what I'm offering, deliverable, and then they get involved, and you can kind of cross-pollinate with them, and that could be a source. And places like that can things to do. And if I pursue all these things, yeah. and, and engage in that, and, and went forward, uh, like your occupation, as yeah. a consultant in the Sean Wolf, yeah. um, from what I'm gathering, you provide consulting and help with having making sure your website is hosted properly and secure. Right, I do that piece. I also do opening stuff where I roll out websites and do plugin developments and build plugins from scratch. Okay. So yeah, I kind of I kind of touch the whole ecosystem of what a WordPress install is. Awesome. Good. I'm going to keep your card. Okay. <laughs> I got a question for you. Yeah. Uh, recently restored a site. Uh, what happened was um, mysterious blog posts were being created. So I had to look into why that was happening. Eventually, I found why it was happening. And um, I ended up using a, uh, a plugin, WordFence. WordFence um, is good, yeah. Yeah, just to have some regular monitoring. And uh, what I noticed was that there's just a ton of traffic hitting some uh, you know, susceptible areas of the site. But mm -hmm. I was just really surprised by the amount. It was like, you know, maybe in one hour. We're oh, talking yeah. about uh, dozens and dozens and dozens, and many of them were being labeled as human. I don't know if they were being incorrectly labeled as human, but whether they're human or bot, would you say that's fairly typical for a uh, WordPress site that's been live for a few years? Yes, because it's well indexed, and it's there to be found. If it's a little bit old, it might not be up on all its updates, mm -hmm. or the environment may not be up on all its updates. So those certain things can contribute to it. 
and a thing I mentioned during the talk about RPC calls. Mm -hmm. An RPC call is made to interject WordPress posts. It's supposed to do that. That's that's its number one job. Like yeah. I saw a Word, uh, an MS Word plugin that you can get. So you type a Word plugin, and you know how you drop down your file save menu. Somewhere in that same sub menu is published to WordPress. Mm -hmm. So that sort of functionality is old school stitched mm -hmm. into a lot of the content management systems out there. What happens is that gets exploited too often, mm -hmm. and somebody will come up with a way to fake getting past the credentials mm -hmm. and just pushing blog posts, and then you're you're, you're going. Yeah. yeah. Remember that time when you added my email address to like one of our security monitoring things? Oh yeah. I'm like, getting like I'm like my whole inbox is full of like warnings from this one the website you have to take off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the website wasn't any way popular. No. It was no what just happened was they thought there. it was exploitable. So we're just being pounded mercilessly. And it's because they're hoping to get through the exploits. And in some cases, if there's a file in WordPress called xmlrpc.php, and uh, you can lock it down. In some cases, I go, well, what's, the, what's the harm of just deleting it? And in some cases, right. if it's problematic, I'll just delete it. And every time I do an update, and WordPress reinsures it, it. Kill it. Yeah. Just because the, the win, the tiny, tiny win of xmlrpc is nothing compared to the headaches it's buying for it, right? For sure. I ended up just putting an instant ban on anybody that tries to access it. So. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then, but the thing there is some plugin, to, again, if you don't read soups and nuts on a given plugin, some plugin might think it's the best thing ever to integrate with that, and then, uh -huh. and then, then that hits you. So, Interesting. But again, I, I will whack it out, yeah. and then uh, if there's any blowback from taking it out, yeah. then I'll put it back and make sure I put bumpers on it. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, Sean, what keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? <laughs> <laughs> the projects I haven't finished. <laughs> um, I, I think you know things that concern me about about. Uh, that's a good question. There's so many things that keep me up at night. Uh, <laughs> I'll go with your first <laughs> No, um, you know, to your point. Um, Exploits in WordPress, where did they really think through all the plumbing, and is it so cool that it's going to kill you? Mm -hmm. uh, will the WordPress community go in the direction I keep loving? Because mm -hmm. 10 years ago, I loved Drupal. WordPress is, eh, okay, I'll, I'll do WordPress, but Drupal is it. And back then, it was a lot more approachable and lovable, and had a lot of stuff going on, and the community was all great. Mm -hmm. And then that worked to the point now where it's just a weird thing that the less of a system in you are, the less of a Drupal you admin you are, mm -hmm. and it's WordPress could totally go that way too, because developers want scalable, easy to work with things, and the way to do it is make it more automated, more push button, more high level, and there's a guy, one place I worked with, who just ran circles around me, assistant administration, and we had, no lie, 40 Drupal websites, and he would just prep for a morning, hit a button, and all of them would have their individual fixes done, it would populate Jira tickets, it would update the right actors who own the websites and do everything. And he did three hours of prep work and building a script, and, just, uh, and, tunk, and it did everything. And it was amazing to see this corporate website just juggernaut turn on a dime from his automation. But you have somebody like me, who's a developer who's not as much of a system in. And I look and I go, I just want to go and update the plugins I think are good. And, and that scaling is, is so important to do, but it still has to be an approachable Project because the reason why WordPress is running at close, you know, 30, uh, 35, 39% of the 33%. 33% of the web is running it, is because it's so attainable. Yeah. And if WordPress in its next jump goes to something that isn't attainable, where it's suddenly the super nerds are the only ones who get to use it, that adoption will, will yeah. plummet. And all of a sudden, all those WordPress people who thought it was great to have some control will go, let's go to Wix. And then off they go. Oh, they go to Classic Press. They go to Classic. I hope they go to Classic. I hope Classic Press again is this is the resolution to that, and that they stay true to this idea of what made WordPress popular, yeah. which is the sort of attainability and good UI. But if they don't, that's what keeps them up. In three years, we'll be giving presentations on Classic Press. Yeah, we will. <laughs> Just like the B two people from ten years ago. We're like B two. Oh no, that's gone. What was the name of that uh, project that came up something? Oh, um, Capstone. Yeah. Capstone. And Capstone, um, again, I'll, I'll give you my card because I've got some breadcrumbs on that. Capstone's a little bit cryptic in that 
it's there, it's been running forever. I once worked, did a capstone project, I had a team work for me like way back when. Um, but getting to the email address for the capstone people, good luck. The way you're gonna find it is by asking me because I spent I spent hours and the closest I got was the contact form at Camos and then three. So it's awesome, it's powerful, it's handy, especially if you have some code you want to roll up, you want to write yourself. But it's cryptic about how you interface with it. Can you go volunteer with like ladies learning code? Yeah, I did that while that yeah, that's thing? that's another thing too, is um, to your point, uh, Ladies Learning Code was started uh, a while back. It's a national thing, but it's since morphed into Canada Learns Code. Mm -hmm. And up in Nanaimo, Sarah Bromley is doing stuff, and I, that's who I really connect with on the topic. And with them, they get a whole bunch of people in a room who are somewhere in a junior skill set level, or just raw as anything, and say, let's learn this. Mm -hmm. And then they have expert people who sit there, like a ratio of like five people trying to learn to one expert. We'll just sit at a table and say, what's your question? What can I do to get you through a long jam? And then they'll do that sort of collective learning style. And because it's brought into Ladies Learning Code to Canada Learns Code, it, and even then when it was Ladies Learning Code, there was a few guys there learning. They weren't, they weren't exclusive to anyone. Um, but now it's Canada Learns Code, it may be an opportunity where there could be a WordPress aspect to it. Where you go, who wants to learn WordPress? I want to be in the Canada Learns Code for WordPress and start to form up a team out of, out of that. There's a few other that just came to mind for anyone else who's interested too. Um, Q College is here in town and they have a program where you can learn stuff. We mostly focus on people but also do WordPress. Uh, WP Elevation is another online community of people and there are people on the island who are doing WP Elevation, which is like a six, nine month course where you can learn. It's more focused on starting a WordPress business rather than like learning how to do the code and basic stuff like that. Um, also, Net2 is tech people who are working with charities, which is my main focus. And there's a lot of people, young people especially, who are kind of around there, many uh, from different kind of spaces, but there'll be a lot of WordPress people that reach it. Mm -hmm. Net2. Net2, yeah, and they meet regularly every month or so that time. Yeah, good advice. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you very much, Sean. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Come on, big hands. You did a good job. We didn't come up here more often. It saves me having yeah. to prepare, prepare a presentation. I don't have to I can share the stage with others. So, thanks for coming out to the WordPress meetup. We do have two social meetups coming up uh, one in June, one in July. This is the last actual seminar uh, meetup for the rest of the uh, until the fall. And starting in September, we will be given these same seminars again, though they'll be in that much nicer room over uh, there by the uh, uh, optical place. I have a question. Yep. Why do you do this? I do it mo mostly to get my name out there and let people know I have a WordPress business. I used to do it just to teach people, and I still do it to teach and educate and bring people in. But I'm not going to lie, it's to benefit my business, you know, and, and to help the other presenters benefit their businesses. Yes. Because if we don't get out and tell people, they don't know we exist. Yes, I didn't know we existed. Yeah. So now, and that well, that's the thing. We, we, and but it does show our expertise in the field and show that we know what we're talking yeah. about when we give presentations and help. And we're also open to reach out to us afterwards. We'll answer email questions. You know, at the moment it gets to a point where you're asking too much, and we say, "We need to charge you now." <laughs> you know, because I do do that. I'll answer questions, help people out, but the moment they start asking too much, I say, look, at this point here, I need to sit you down and charge you a fee, because now you're eating up way too much time. Mm -hmm. I'll also say, this is one of the best guys to know in town for hacked websites, because that's oh. a specialty, yeah. and uh, he saved my butt a couple times when I got in trouble and I didn't know what to do, and that's not my world, but he is a real expert on being able to repair hack sites. Mm -hmm. And so it, it helps me sleep at night to know that someone <laughs> can use that. After, 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 use. The, after the hack, yeah, that's yeah. what I do, is I help people after the uh, yeah. nightmare started. Yeah. yeah, still great. It brings me to my favorite hack ever when I was actually fighting with the hacker live. Oh, yeah, live? Yeah. Live. <laughs> because I had a program running that was monitoring everything. He was changing, I was fixing it back, and I was trying to find his back door. That reminds me of that scene in Hackers. Oh, that's pretty much like what it was. You were pretty into the YouTube. I was fighting against the hacker. It lasted for about an hour and a half until I found his back door and shut him down. Nice. And it was it was it was it was cool. It was my best hack ever. <laughs> <laughs>
but it is a challenge and it's fun. But yeah, that's why I do this. And that's why these other guys come out. That's why Jacob comes out and speaks, why Sean comes out and speaks. I try to get other speakers to present, anyone who wants to present. I'm more than willing to share the stage. I don't want to always be doing the presentations because they take time to prep. And sometimes, I, sometimes I'm like the day before and I'm still working on the presentation because I haven't had time to work on it. So, anyway, thank you all for coming out. It's much appreciated. To those thank of you. YouTube, thank you for watching. We actually had a bit of an audience tonight, so thank you very much. Nice. Cool. Do you guys always... Uh, live stream it? Yeah. Yeah. I live, I live stream it to my uh, YouTube channel. Okay, I guess that's on your website. And it's on my website at WP Plugin.